Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I would like to thank the NCCAA committee for inviting me to be the speaker for this morning. It's an honor and a privilege to be of service at any capacity for Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous has changed my life dramatically from where I come from. And I would like to say if you're new here, I hope that you're desperate. Because that's what it takes to stay in these rooms. I truly believe, and this is only my belief, is sobriety is a gift. I don't think that some of us deserve it more than others. I don't think that we're better than people who lead us. I just think that it's a precious gift and some of us are more teachable. And what happens is to be teachable, you have to be desperate. And when I came into these rooms, I was desperate. In dying, I was dead. I love San Jose and it's an awesome place to be. It's like being home here with friends. This is also San Jose's where my friend Bruce Homola was from. So this one's for you, Bruce. I would um, like to say that my sobriety date is July 9, 1994. My home group is Dry Diggins in Auburn. It meets on Thursday nights at 7. And so now we'll get on with my story. <laughs> um, sponsorship is very important to me. I do have a sponsor. I've always believed in solid, solid sponsorship. I've never been without a sponsor, but I truly do believe that that um, that is the blueprint with the steps in the big book and meetings of how to get out of this insanity and madness. What happened is when I was two years old, my dad died of this disease. He was only 20. He saw no way out of this madness, so he took his own life. He was a alcoholic, and he was also a drug addict who worked in a pharmaceutical company. There's not much that I know about my dad because of the family secrets, and my mom did the best that she could do with the tools that she had to survive. She was 20 years old when that happened also. You could just imagine with a two-year-old kid, a husband committing suicide due to alcoholism, the tools that she had were not very good. <laughs> so I grew up in a pretty insane house. What I did find out about my dad is that he loved me very, very much. I was the apple of his eye. He used to take my baby bottle, fill him up with booze, and go to work. In this pharmaceutical company that he worked at, one time he got so drunk and I hear that he fell into the vat. <laughs> and they had to get him out. That's all I know about my dad. The rest are all family secrets, and my mom will probably go to the grave with taking those secrets with her. But I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous that I do not have to go to the grave with any secrets, and I'm free from the steps with that. What happened after my dad did that was my mom married some other man, and he was in the Aryan Brotherhood. You could just imagine what our house was like. I have a brother that's two years younger than me, and my original dad, my biological dad, died when I was two. My brother has a different dad that was in the Aryan Brotherhood, but I'm two years older than him. I still haven't quite figured that one out yet. It's one of those family secrets, (laughs) which I'll probably never know about. And it was very unusual for us to have very much calmness in our house. We lived in Southern California. I grew up in Southern California. We lived in these apartments, and I was five years old. My brother was three. One night, my brother and I were playing in the bedroom. My mom came running in the in the bedroom, stuffed my brother and I underneath the bed. My dad jumped on the bed, had a shootout with the cops in the field behind the apartments that we lived in. About five more minutes later, the cops came broke the door down, ransacked the house, and he was off to prison. I'm not sure what he did, but he ended up in a prison with Charles Manson and Timothy Leary. So that was basically, in a nutshell, 
what, you know, the kind of normal type of situations we had. Our family pictures consisted of Polaroid pictures from prison. We had quite a few of those. We would always go on the weekends and visit him at various places. It was, it was just the way that my life was and I didn't know any different. Soon after that, my mom married my third dad who had a lot of money and took very good care of us. What he did was he had a lot of furniture stores down in Southern California. He would keep the money in his desk at work and I would go at a very young age in the third grade already and I would go opening the drawer, you know, taking money out of the pocket, putting it in my pocket, going to school and giving it to the kids. So I was going to school, making up lies already, telling them that my dad worked for Mattel, and I would go to school and they had these little flassy dolls with different colors of hair, and they had various colors, green, orange, purple hair, pink hair. I told the kids my dad worked for Mattel and I went to go take their orders, and I would bring these dolls to school the next day. What had happened was, there was this hole inside my soul. I just needed you to like me so bad that I was giving away my own toys. It was this huge, huge gaping hole in my soul. It was a lie. My dad owned furniture stores, but I just needed these people to like me so much. In the sixth grade, I got called into the principal's office, got kicked out of sixth grade because I was stealing money from my dad giving it to kids at school so they would like me. I got sent off to my grandma's house, who is a very strict German lady. She was in World War II. She was actually, she was actually in the service and was one of the air traffic people for traffic control. She didn't like what she was doing, but she had no choice. My grandmother was, had no choice in had the swastika jewelry, and and she escaped there and, my, and found my grandpa, and he kept her in a, a foxhole and put a board over it and would sneak her food, his rations, so she could survive. And, and they had a very rough life. So what my mom's solution was to send me to this grandma and grandpa's house who had been through all of that. And it was, it was pretty severe. I mean, we would get punished, my brother and I would, if, you know, whenever we'd see each other and we'd have to stand up like this, like crosses with our arms sticking out. And if they sunk down, we'd get our butt kicked. You know, and we had to pretend that we were sitting with a chair without a chair there and, and get locked in rooms. Nowadays, by today's standards, it would be child abuse and it's on the news. You'd get the kids taken for custody. <laughs> Nowadays, when I see stuff like that on the news, I think, right on. You know, take them, take them, and give them to some people who will raise them right. I ended up going back to my mom, getting for good behavior, getting sent back to her, and she always had this relationship with my dad of, you know, leaving. They were always separating. We were always constantly doing geographics. My mom would be on prescription drugs and and whites and speed and wake up my brother and I in the middle of the night and we'd get in our car and we'd go on Wednesday nights, I'll never forget this, on Wednesday nights you get coupons in the newspapers. So we'd go all around Torrance collecting all these news <laughs> newspapers, putting them in the trunk, going back home, dropping them off, filling the back seat, dropping them off, doing them all night and our living room would end up with these newspapers because they had coupons in them. My mom was so strung out on the white that, you know, she would never end up using the coupons, but we'd have this massive amount of newspapers in the, in the living room. It was just, it was just so insane. My dad, who was in prison, ended up getting out of prison, and my brother and I were called into our class and escorted off campus. Because this guy that was in the Aryan Brotherhood, which was my, my dad, was getting out and they weren't sure what he was going to do. And he had known that my mom had remarried. What we were done, what, what was done with our family was we were escorted to Northern California and in hiding for several months. 
and the detectives and everybody kept a really good eye on him because he was so dangerous. We were there with my with my third dad, hiding in seclusion from this other one who got out. He didn't come after my mom, so all was safe. We moved back to Torrance. He didn't come after my mom, so she got back together with him. It was just, and those were normal things. It's not the reason why I drank, but when by the time I found booze, I was 13, and it was like there was some relief. It was like there was some comfortable, comfortableness underneath my own skin. I felt like I could breathe. There was always a problem when I started drinking, though, and that problem was I knew that if I was going to pick up a drink, it was like, hang on, you're going for a ride, and you don't know what's going to happen. The end results were from the get-go were blackouts, vomiting, and no recollection of what had happened the night before. That was that was just it. My friend that I hung around with really couldn't keep up much with me anymore. Right from the beginning, I I had no control. I I knew that there was a problem. I wondered what was wrong with me, and I wondered how come they could stop. But it's like once I picked up that drink, I never had a bad drink. I was always looking for the effect to just escape, to get out of, you know, out of underneath my own skin. It was so uncomfortable. I would drink, and our friends would put cigarette butts in beer cans, and the booze would run out, and I would be desperate, going, oh, my God, I need more booze. My friends would be like, they were okay. So I started drinking the beers with the cigarette butts. And one night our, we were partying, and my friends had said, ooh, look, she's vomiting cigarette butts. <laughs> no, but, but I was so desperate, you know. It worked for me. It worked for me. It was more booze. It was, it was just horrible. In school, I always made it to school only for the social event. I was not your best student. I was I was really popular at school with the guys. My my reputation for my drinking and all of that stuff really with the blackouts and the recollection, you know, the lack of recollection of what had happened, I I was pretty popular and ended up getting a pretty bad reputation. But it, it got so bad and when I was around eighteen I was like I I just started feeling like I was damaged even more from this drinking. And in my eyes, all that was was partying. You know, I just thought, if I, if I could only sometimes stop. But there was, it was, it was just insane. My mom would always tell me, you know, Bridget, you're so, you're such a drama queen. You just, you're really emotional. You're crazy. Something's wrong with you. <laughs> my mom would tell me that. <laughs> It was, it was just something, and, and I truly inside felt that way. What my, my goals were to be in life was to be a psychiatric nurse. I lived down in, in Torrance, down by Harbor General Hospital, and one of my favorite things to do was there were eight floors. I would love to go in the hospital, go on the elevator, go up to the eighth floor where the psych unit was, bang on the door, have the people who were nutty come running after me and make faces at them. <laughs> was one of my favorite things to do. I was like a magnet to that place, just like drawn to it. It, it was just, I'm the one who belonged on the other side of the doors. But I just didn't, didn't know. So pretty soon, I ended up you know, being in relationships with boyfriends. It was real intense. I was dramatic. If I got this idea like, like that quick, you know, I would be in a car with them, and I would get this idea that they don't love me, and I'd throw the car door open and jump out, you know, and roll out, out of the car. And I had this big old scar on the, on the side of me with road rash from this happening one time. I was living down there with this boyfriend. He didn't have enough money for me to go to the hospital. And my mom had moved up to Northern California. I came up to visit them, and I never ended up going back down to Southern California. It was it was another geographic. It, it worked good for me. My mom and dad left us 
the house in, in Sacramento. My mom and dad ended up moving to Auburn, opening a furniture store. And what they did was they paid the rent at this house, yet we didn't get any money for our expenditures that we would need monthly. So what my brother and I decided to do was we, on our front door, we painted $2 on it. We spray painted $2 on the front door. And on every Friday and Saturday night, we would have a party across the street from Bella Vista High School down in Sacramento. We'd get all, collect all the money and get the keg of beer. Then I would go down the street to 7-Eleven. On the payphone, I'd call the police. And I'd say, there's a disturbance down the road from here. And give them the address. Say, there's this wild party going on. And they needed to send somebody out. And the cops would come out, evacuate the house. We'd have the keg hidden in the closet and have everybody gone. And then we would have an intimate party with ten people of our closest friends with a keg paid for. It was it was a lot of fun. I also dated for food. I would go to restaurants, really nice restaurants with guys, and get a bunch of food and then bring half of it home to my brother so we could eat. After a while of this, we got evicted from that house. We had this one uh, trailer on the property, and we would stuff all of our beer cans in it. My mom and dad came to the house and opened up the thing, and it was just full of cans. And they said, you guys are out of here. So we ended up moving up to Auburn. And I truly respect Alcoholics Anonymous. My alcoholism led me to places where I never thought I'd go. When I moved to Auburn, I was just continued this party and, you know, I was just out there for fun. And like you hear in this program, it's alcoholism fun, fun with problems, and then problems. And at a young age, I really hit a wall with it. One day I was driving down Auburn, met some guys in a Jeep, my friend and I did, and they asked us what we were doing, and I said, nothing. We didn't really have nothing to do. They told us that they were going camping out in Hellhole, and they would be there in a few hours, and we asked them where it was. I, I didn't know because I had grown up in the city, and this was the boonies now. So we went out there, and a few hours later, these guys showed up, and they had a bunch of alcohol with them and a massive amount of drugs. What happened when we were partying was, at first I noticed the drugs were in abundance, and then I noticed as the night went on, you know, first there were like railers for us, and then all of a sudden they started getting thinner and thinner and tinier and tinier like toothpicks, and that really made me mad. <laughs> so I went up to the guy and I said, can you, can you give me a front? And he said, sure. And I found out where he lived or had his business, and I said, I promise, I swear, you know, I'll be there this week to pay you back for it. And he said, okay. And I stayed really close to my girlfriend that night, because I didn't want to be real close to these guys. I didn't know if we were going to get raped or, you know. I mean, this is a crazy situation here. So we made it back to Auburn safe, and a few days later I went to this business because I'm such an honest person. Actually, I just met a new connection. And went to this business and went day after day after day, and no one was there. And I thought, we'll write this one off. And a couple months later, my brother and I were driving down the street and through this neighborhood in Auburn. And I went, oh, my gosh, there's that Jeep. That's the guy that, remember when I told you, you know, all that stuff they had? And he said, yeah. He said, let's go over there. So I, I went over there and played the part of, you know, long-lost friends. I was so happy to see him. And we were partying with him and drinking and drinking. And this guy comes home, one of the roommates, and he had this bad attitude, and he slams his briefcase on the counter. And I look, and I think, that guy's a jerk. You know, and I go to the bathroom and come out later, and I, during this time, he tells my brother that I'm really cute, and he'd like to go out with me. And I'm like, I want to go out with a loser like that. He's a drug dealer. I never ended up leaving that house. I just stayed. What happened during that time, very fast, 
very, very fast time. So I got caught up in a world that I never knew even existed. And in my thinking, all that I could think of was, how did a nice girl like me get in a jam like this? You know, how did a nice girl like me get in a jam like this? It was a very, very dangerous house, extremely dangerous. It was not unusual for someone to pull up in our driveway, walk out to the trunk, get a gun out, cock it up, knock on the front door looking for someone. I, I was just a mess. I was only 20 at this time. This guy was 25, who my boyfriend was. I ended up getting pregnant very, very quickly. I started going to the doctors a lot. He started to tell him, you know, I've got these aches and these pains. And one time when I was younger, I got my foot caught in spokes, and I was in the hospital for two weeks and I almost had to amputate my foot because the infection was on the bone. Maybe I'm dying. And so I, the doctor visits were more frequent. And I would go to the doctors, and they'd say, do you have any hobbies? I would say no, and they'd say, you should get some. They'd say, well, maybe you should give me some crutches. Or, you know, maybe that will help. And I would go back home and drink, party all night, very, very paranoid. And I thought I looked so good. My dad would come over to the house and say, Bridget, you're a mess. You need to put more makeup on. You're not looking that good. Maybe you should put some lipstick on. And I was just trapped in this world. I was told what would happen to me if I left. I truly believed it because of all the stuff that went on at that house. I didn't tell people that I was pregnant because one thing, they were going to hold out on the booze. I needed the booze so bad. I kept on drinking through that whole pregnancy. We got we got kicked out of that house. I want to tell you, just like in the big book says, you know, us as an alcoholic, pretty soon we can't separate the truth from the false. What happened for me with where my alcoholism took me was I was seven and a half months pregnant with my stomach sticking out to here. It's like <laughs> pregnant, full flight from reality. Right? You could just picture this. I drive over to this free pregnancy testing place in Auburn. I go get a test. It comes back positive, and I'm devastated. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. You know, the clothes that I wore were bigger and bigger. We get evic evicted from this house again from my significant partner's mom. She said, you know what? She said, this is not going to be a flop house. You guys are out of here. So we, we get in our little trailer. Remember that one that we used to stuff the booze in, me and my brother? And this trailer's on my mom and dad's property. SUVs are bigger than this trailer, by the way. And we thought we had it going on. There was, our clothes were piled up on one side, folded up nicely. On the left side of it, the floor was rotten. You could see the ground. And our electricity hooked up to mom and dad's house. And we got it going on. Some acquaintance that I knew at that time came up to me. She had the nerve. And she said, Bridget, you know, you're going to have a baby if you taken a look at your life. I know of a place in San Francisco where they do abortions in the third trimester. I think that's the final stage of it. And it's, it's not a pretty sight. And I was terrified. And it really, let me tell you, she saw something, though. She saw how how messed up my life was, yet I didn't. And I was so offended that she would even offer to take me there. But she knew that this baby that I was going to have, she knows what the outcome was going to be. So I ended up not going there with her. She was, I was highly offended. I kept on doing what I was doing. And... Having my baby, a baby girl, I used to have nightmares. She, I would just think, you know, I would be haunted by this. When she was born, I counted her, her fingers, her toes. And by God's grace, there was something that went on that I looked back on. Every time I was drinking 
in doing what I was doing, the extracurricular stuff that I was doing, I would all of a sudden get nauseous, and I would go in the bathroom and get sick. It was God's grace. She was born healthy. This relationship that I was in, we, we continued doing what we were doing. We ended up moving out on our own, going to a house up in uh, Nevada City. I was just a full-out whack job, <laughs> like a wing nut. I mean, I, I was just like crazy, and I just thought, you know, if I just get this guy out of my life, I could live the life that I was meant to have. How did a nice girl like me get dealt a hand like this? So um, anyway, I'm, I'm a hairstylist, and I, I went to cosmetology school and finally started building this stuff up. And But I met some more drinking buddies, and we used to drink every Friday, every Thursday, every Wednesday, every Tuesday in cosmetology school. And in a storage room, I knew how to hide bottles real good, so we put all the bottles in the storage place. And one day, the instructor that owned the school came and saw all these bottles, and we, people got in trouble, but I still graduated. And I ended up getting my cosmetology license, working in a salon, and I, I finally started to do stuff on my own. There was a woman that I worked with. Her name was Rebecca. And Rebecca was this really, really standoffish type of person. And there were only a few things that I knew about Rebecca. Is you don't book her for any appointments at 12 o'clock because she goes to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And everybody whispered she was an alcoholic. You know? It was like this, she's an alcoholic. She was also an ex-prostitute. What I found was I was really drawn to Rebecca. She took me underneath her wing. During that time, what I would do when Rebecca was mixing colors, I would run in the back room and I'd say, you know, this is what's going on in the relationship. He says that, you know, I'm a waste of life. If I got out of his life, everything would be well and wonderful. You know, is, is that true? Do you think he loves me? And that's where my thinking was. You know, and, and she said, I don't know, Bridget, but you carry around a big bag of rocks and you need to go to Al-Anon. And I was highly offended, but I went to Al-Anon. They didn't tell her I was drinking because he was the loser. He's the one who drank more than me. He got the DUIs. He, he did that whole, whole thing like that. I was just the nice girl and, and kept all those secrets and, and went to great lengths to hide that life. You know, it's a lot of juggling to do. Pretty, you know, it's just crazy. It's crazy. I would go to these Al-Anon meetings, and this guy, the secretary said, you know, welcome, you finally hit your bottom. I'm like, Me? I'm not even, I don't have a problem. <laughs> and they would never let an Al-Anon meeting close without me sharing. It was such a basket case. <laughs> my my boyfriend ended up getting so mad, you know, he's saying, you know, you're in a cult, all they, they just want your money. And <laughs> things started getting really worse at home. I was told what would happen if I left. I was in, in major detail. I mean, in major, it was very graphic. And there was... Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I believed it. So I called the women's shelter after I started getting some, getting some of this stuff with the steps and, you know, getting a God in my life and knowing, you know, things, God's in control of this. God, God's in control, you know. One, two, three, step one, two, three, step twelve, take alcoholics to meetings, you know, gotta do service work and I'm, I'm just a nut. You know, gotta leave this alcoholic, I'm, Going to Alateen, I'm an Alateen sponsor, going in with dry heaves, strung out, you know, talking about alcoholics, and I did that for a while. <laughs> it doesn't work very good. I finally got the courage after a, a period of time. I, I did the footsteps called the women's shelter, and they thought it was a crank phone call. And they asked if they could have my phone number and call me back, and they did. But what I did was, because I know what happens, when there's stuff going on in a house. I know what happens when people get hurt. I know how to survive. What I did was I wrote a letter for when I was missing. I wrote the letter. I said, one, 
what was going to happen to me. I didn't know where I was going to be, but I wrote down in great details of what was going to happen and who did it to me. We had sliding doors in our bedroom closet. What I did was I taped the letter to the back of the, of the sliding closet door because I know that when people are missing and the cops come and ransack your house, I know what they do. And this guy was going to get caught. I did what I needed to do to protect myself. Ended up leaving, went to work. A couple days later, I'm driving down Highway 80, kind of checked the rearview mirror into a Kibley. Something just told me. A few cars back, I see this Volkswagen. It's, it's him. I go hauling, hauling down Bell Road, go to the sheriff's station, go sliding in there. He gets out of his car. I get out of mine start yelling at each other. Some detectives came out. They asked what's going on. It's a domestic thing. I got my restraining order. This is going on. He's following me. They pull him off. He gets arrested. They question me. Does this man own a, a double-edged dagger? I said, no, I've never seen one. He said, there was, the detective said there was one on the passenger seat without the sheet. God's grace once again. I was able to leave him and start living the life that I thought I was entitled to have. Bar drinking. Not that bar drinking's bad, but I took myself with me. I'm the kind of drunk that, you know, I always manipulated my drinks. I always did. I was the type of person that if you had the money, I was going to get the booze somehow. And, and I knew that I started hanging out at this holiday place up in Nevada City, drinking, and, I mean, it, it was bad. I knew that 20 bucks got me four Zimas, and I wouldn't tip the waitress because that got in the way of the booze. <laughs> I would just catch her another time, and that's what we alcoholics do. I was hanging out with these people in, inside these new friends that I had at this place, and they would order the drinks, and I would say, can I, can I take a taste of your drink? And they'd say, sure, and I'd slam it down. He, let me tell you, you piss a lot of people off doing that. <laughs> people would be dancing on the floor. I'd go looking around at drinks, slamming them down. I would walk up to the lead singer in bands and, you know, kind of flip their collar over, and they'd go, what are you doing? And I'd say, just checking to see if you were made in heaven. And they'd go, get away from me. You're, you know, didn't even want to touch me. And I, I could have never been a groupie while drinking. So I have no social drinking skills. Pretty soon, you know, people were trying to take my keys away from me. I'd flip the table in the bar, and they'd just hand the keys back and say, here, Bridget, we cared, but get out of here. So I'd start walking. Now, and I did get pulled over for DUIs. But I just talk my way out of them. He got pulled over a lot of times. One time my friend Shonda and I were driving down Highway 49 and I was in this little car and flying down the road and went to go make a left and she started screaming, Bridget, what are you doing? And I said, making a left hand turn. And I, I came to and there was no left hand turn to make. There was just an embankment. And those are the kind of things that happen. So this person, Shonda, who was my new best friend, this was when I was hitting my bottom. My, I started spiraling. It started catching up with me. My boss started confronting me at work. I was living at my mom and dad's house once again with my daughter because I knew when I was at home with my mom and dad that my daughter would get food, some shelter, and she would be safe. I knew that for sure. So as I was hitting my bottom, hanging out with these friends, from April 3rd to July 9th, we ended up spending $10,000 on booze and partying. And the reason why I know that was because, one, I was dying. And I will never forget those dates because from April 3rd to July 9th, I only had 18 nights of sleep from drinking and partying, all that. I spiraled down fast. I was visiting the doctors more frequently. I couldn't even stop drinking before the visits. 
My boss was confronting me at work, saying, you know, you say that you have bronchitis, and the woman at Rayleigh said that you came in here with a friend and bought a basket full of booze. And my comment to that was, you know, she just doesn't like me. She's just jealous of me. You know, it, and my brother, he lived in Sacramento at the time and ran into one of our friends and who lived in Auburn, and this guy said to my brother, your sister's really messing up. She's really messing up, and I, I was truly dying. I started to get lung problems. I, I had an inhaler on my station. I was cutting hair. I'd shake, and I'd have this inhaler, and I'd suck on it. I'd have the dry heaves. I would excuse myself from a customer. Excuse me for, you know, it's like, oh, God, here they are again. You know, I would have a styrofoam cup of beer with suds coming back up, sucking on that. And I was ripping off stuff at work, ripping off my boss's time, and just I was a mess. I would go to work with my clothes wadded up because, you know, I would – say, oh my gosh, I'm never going to do this again because I hate feeling like this at work. And then 5 o'clock would come around, and I'd forget. 5 o'clock, it was on again. It was this continual insanity. There was a guy that worked a few doors down, and he would say, hey, Bridget, why don't you why don't you just go home and cook your daughter dinner? And I would turn around and say, shut up, Dan. You know, mind your own business. People saw this all around me. I was the last one to know I was an alcoholic. The tornado was everywhere. I volunteered in my daughter's class one day a week. It's the day that I saw her because I'm such a good mom. When I would get to her class, she would hang on to my leg. Mom, mom. And I would just kind of play it off like, yeah, we're so close. But you know, this was kind of cutting into my time here. But I put my time in. My brother invited me over to dinner one night, and I thought we were going to do some bonding and go rollerblading down by the river. What he told me was, Mom's getting ready to get custody of Noel. My game was up. I quickly, quickly just spiraled into that bottom. In that apartment, when I hit my bottom, I was going to never forget this. Because if you ever, if you're new here and you ever forget your last drink, that's a scary place to be. And if you're an old timer here and you ever forget your last drink, that's a real scary place to be too because then you're closer to the next one. In this apartment, it was a pig pen. Empty bottles, sticky floors, lemons, just, it was Death. The blinds were pulled. No sunlight came in. We were just in this world, spending this money fast and hard on this alcohol. I would slam down the booze because I needed them so bad. And then I would walk out to the balcony. And it got to the point where alcohol, I couldn't live without it, and I couldn't live with it. My only prayer that I had during that time was, Oh, God, I hope they don't hear me vomiting because they're not going to give me any more booze. Because I would get sick off the balcony. Clean myself off, walk back in, ready for some more booze. And I'd do it again. I remember that those people in Al-Anon were so nice. So I decided I'm going to go back there and work a better Al-Anon program. Al-Anon doesn't work very good doing 1, 2, 3, and 12, especially if you're an alcoholic. So I went to some open AA meetings so I could work the steps better. And the people were happy when I came back, but I went to Al-Anon and I was like, whoa, this is freaky here. I went in there and, you know, there's all of us and it's, it's a great place to be, and I'd, I would sit in the back, and I'm, like, shaking, and people would ask if I would want to share something, and I'd say, oh, no, no, I'm from Elanon. You know, and they'd say, okay, just keep coming back. 
And other people would glare at me and say, you know, you've got your own room to go to. You need to be in Al-Anon. So some old timers would give you real evil eyes from across the table. But there was something in there that I needed, and I kept on going back. What happened was, and if you're new here, I want to say, never let anybody chase you out of the room of Alcoholics Anonymous. Look for the similarities and not the differences. Because when I was in there and I was sitting by the back door, I appointed myself the greeter. Sitting on my hands, watching people, you know, real scared in there. And, oh, my God, oh, my God, this is so scary. But it was exciting because people cussed. People were very colorful. <laughs> it, was, it was just like, whoa, this is, this is neat. I felt safe. And if people would walk out to smoke a cigarette, I'd say, bye, see you later. And they'd say, oh, no, I'm not going. I'm just going to smoke a cigarette. And I'd be like, okay. I didn't want to get too close to you. You guys were kind of not my type of people. <laughs> You know, there's some, you know it, it was just kind of weird. I had a lot going on up here. I was engaged to a cop at the time. And so I thought, this is, you know, these people are talking about bottoms and losing houses and losing jobs. And I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I, I just opened a business. I, I, um, I'm engaged to a cop. I used to be with a drug dealer. And <laughs> this sobriety stuff is good. And I started listening for the similarities and not the differences in relating. And I would hear the women share, and I would think, oh, my gosh, I did that, but I didn't get caught. One of the lies was gone. You know, those lies, it takes a lot to juggle that stuff. And I would think, wow. And one time there was this woman who shared and she's this beautiful woman, and she talked about her behavior of what she did when she was drinking. And I, I was like, wow, I could really relate to all of that stuff. I went up and I got that 20 questions and answered them. And when I answered them, I, I passed the test, but I still went around to the women and asked them if they thought I was an alcoholic. And they said, I don't know, Bridget, but that's up for you to decide, but keep coming back. And I did. I also would give the women fake phone numbers. They'd say, can we have your phone number? And I'd give them fake phone numbers. See, because I'm living with a cop, right? Cops arrest alcoholics all the time. So it can't give, you know, can't give up my gig here. You know, got to kind of keep this going here. What happened was that person was my higher power. It, it, things don't, when you have a significant other in a relationship and put them as your higher power, I don't suggest that. So I kept on going to meetings. I got myself a sponsor. At that time, I got myself the toughest sponsor I could find. It was a little old lady. Her name is Casey. And she was this little bitty lady. And now she's like 80 years old. And she said, we're going to have to smash your ego. And I was like, whoa, I don't even have any self-esteem. <laughs> what is this lady talking about? My God, jeez. I, I like to say that God sicked her on me. She's exactly what I needed to be, have it as a sponsor. She's a very good sponsor for when you just get in, because she just chews your butt like hamburger meat. I was so desperate and so dying when I came into these rooms that I was willing to follow whatever Casey had suggested. And as I shared my story with you earlier, all those secrets, I was taking that stuff with me to the grave. I got to share all of that stuff with Casey. And one, what I learned was, when I went to meetings, I heard the old timers say stuff like this. Oh, it's not the last drink that got you, it's the first drink. And I'd sit there and I'd think, that's got to be the most stupidest thing I'd ever heard. It's the last drink that got me walking in a bathroom with someone who I didn't know. It's the last drink that got me in that fight. And it's that last drink that got me in a blackout. What's going on with this? And what happened was Casey explained to me was it was the obsession that centered in the mind and the compulsion. And the obsession was, you know, if I don't drink tequila tonight, people aren't going to get hurt. <laughs> So I'll stick with beer. And once again, it was on. 
It wasn't different when I picked up boots. Also, with working through the steps, what I got to find out was my life was self-will run riot disconnected from God, from my higher power. I had a lot of issues with God. One of them was, was if there really was a God, how would I end up with this life that I have now? So I have trust issues with this thing going on. I also got to continue working the steps with her doing the fourth step, finding out how manipulative I was, seeing how I operated, seeing what Bridget's gains really were on paper. Continuing working the steps, and if you're new, I don't suggest this to my, my first amends thing was like a hit list on the telephone for like 10 quick minutes. Oh, hi, this is Bridget. I'm sorry for what I did. That's, I, I really wouldn't suggest that. I, I do suggest working the steps over and over again. That's what's worked for me. There's been a, a long period of time where, like I said earlier, I've changed sponsors, and I've always had a sponsor, and I take a piece of them with me in my heart. They've all taught me something. And sometimes it's just time to move on. I ended up getting... Married in sobriety for the first time ever, and that's my husband, Doug. We ended up getting married on June 7th, seven years ago, and we met in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and what we did was we started a friendship. He was one of the guys who I could go up to and feel safe. You know that 13-step stuff. <laughs> Caution against it. <laughs> so what we really did was we, we really got to know each other. And one of the things was that we promised each other was we were dating, getting to know each other, and never going to put sobriety on the back burner. Because I had watched in these rooms and watched some people when they get together and hook up, pretty soon you'd start seeing less and less of them. AA became not that important because they got busy creating a home. We ended up having an AA wedding which was absolutely wonderful. I'd like to tell you that we got married June 7th, and Doug joined Al-Anon six months later. <laughs> he became an active member of Al-Anon. Because when you live with an alcoholic like me, you need, need to bear with it. <laughs> Always under progress. My daughter, Noelle, is something that I would like to touch on. I didn't know how to be a mom. My sponsor helped walk me through that. I would pick up Noelle from school, and my sponsor t taught me, take Noelle and go get ice cream. And I would go pick up Noelle and say, come on, Noelle, we're going to get ice cream. And she'd say, Mom, I don't want to go get ice cream with you. And I would be devastated call up the sponsor, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, she didn't want to go get ice cream with me, and she doesn't want to bond with me, and she said, Bridget, she's probably wondering what's wrong with you. You know, that's the kind of mom I am. You guys taught me how to be a mom. Noelle's bedroom, when I got sober, consisted of just her mattress. Birthdays would come, birthdays would go, Christmas would come, Christmas would go. She would pack up her stuff and bring it to her dad. See, I had been very unstable doing geographics all the time. Noelle didn't know what to do with all this. I didn't know what to do with all this. I followed direction. If you're new here and you're looking for a sponsor, make sure they have something that you want. Make sure that they're living a life that you see that's shown how the program works. That's what I did. Pretty soon after years started going by and Doug's her stepdad and all of that and stuff, we're making this home, we're working the traditions in our house. Noelle's room's getting messier and messier. You can't even barely get the door open. I mean, if you walk in there, you'll trip over things. 
you know, and, and um, we, have a, we have a happy home. She started going to visit her dad less and less because there was more stability in our house. She did really good with her schoolwork. And I think, you know, how did a woman like me from where I came from get to be able to do something like this? At about three and a half years of Doug's in my marriage, we were going, we were getting ready to go somewhere one day, and he called me in the bathroom, and there was right on his shoulder right here, he thought he had a mole, and he called me in there and asked me what it was, and I went in the bathroom, and it was a tick. You know, when you live up in the hills or anywhere where there's brush or anywhere, even by the ocean, you know, ticks are around. One thing that I, I knew it, it wasn't a very good thing, because I have a, a client whose husband was bit by a tick, and he was on kidney dialysis. I, I suggested to Doug for him to get it tested, and we, we had a debate on how to remove it, how not to remove it. So we compromised and did both of the things. And I, I stuck the thing in a jar and wanted him to go to the doctors and get it tested and continually asked him to, you know, get it tested. And he said, I'll go do it if I get a rash. Okay. The rash never showed up. He, and we ended up throwing the tick away. About two months later, he started getting some extremely bizarre symptoms. It was flu season, and he felt like he had the flu. It was on a Wednesday, and he said from that point on, it felt like he was ran over by a truck, and he never felt the same. He started going to the doctors and visiting them. They were testing him for rare blood diseases, and I'm going, okay, this is really scary here. They were testing him for lupus, various other things. I told him to make sure you tell the doctor that you were bit by a tick, and he did, and the doctor said you would have seen something by now, so it's, it's all good. The symptoms started getting more bizarre. That doctor sent him to a neurologist, and I went to the doctor's appointment with him, and I, I'm scared to death. I'm thinking, you know, here, here I am. I finally found the love of my life, and, and this stuff is going on. The symptoms were worse. When the test came back, it was positive that he had Lyme's disease, which is an insidious disease. Death even can happen from it. And what happened was our world as we knew it went upside down. But thank God I was involved in service work in H&I, very involved in H&I. At that time, I was doing area for H&I. Had some friends request that I step down, let someone else do it. I, I realize that I'm not an important person. I need AA, and AA doesn't need me. The reason why I didn't step down was there was one big reason, was I watch people when they come in here, and the more they give up their commitments, the less you see of them, the less sobriety becomes of importance, the less and less we see of them. Pretty soon, the kind of alcoholic I am, I would feel so uncomfortable underneath my own skin, my only option would be to take a drink. So we get this news, and I'm freaking out. Because, like I said, you can die from this disease. And I just think, oh, my God, where do I go from here? And I walk in the bathroom. And I turn the light on, and in the, in the bathroom is the prayer of St. Francis, right on the wall. And there was some comfort with that. So I call my sponsor up afterwards. I give her the news. And the symptoms that you can get from this are so insidious that they mimic many different diseases, Lou Gehrig's, fibromyalgia, MS. All, all across the board, Crohn's disease. And in fact, since my husband did get this disease, we have two very close friends who have died from this disease. And one of them, one of them, we brought all the information that we could to this friend and had them take a test. And a couple months before they died, it was a positive Lyme disease test. 
but they were being treated for something different. And that was a very hard thing to watch. A very, very hard thing to watch. What my sponsor said was during that whole time as Bridget, you've got to take the high road, you've got to walk with your higher power. And on a daily basis, through treatment and all of that stuff, I would be like, you know, there was that alcoholism stuff going, man, I didn't sign up for this. I did not sign up for this. I started taking a look more at that prayer of St. Francis. And in the language of the heart, in that book, if you look in the back under the index and look under the prayer of St. Francis, you go look in there and it says to seek and do God's will. You know, to do the next right thing. And it was like, hang on, you're going for a ride. And every day was like a roller coaster. You know, I would open up my eyes and I would think, man, how can I go in life and go to work and act like everything is normal? Well, with this program, you can. And it's an awesome, it's an awesome thing because I only had to do it for 24 hours a day. What happened during that time is we didn't have medical insurance with, with my husband's former employer. We were right, right on the verge of it. We had a booklet to pick out the provider. Our home group had a barbecue and raised a lot of money for his treatments and medicine. And we would go home and we would find an envelope on our doorstep with a big, big wad of money. I'm not going to tell you guys our address. <laughs> but we would, we would just walk home and we'd go, what's this? You know, just like, and we'd open it up and it would be full of hundreds, hundred stacks of hundred dollar bills. During that time, one of Doug's medicines was $950 a month. That was only one of them. I became the only one working at that time, running, you know, taking care of this daughter, doing all this stuff, staying sober, sponsoring lots of newcomers. <laughs> it was like, oh, man, they'll keep you sober. It was like, they were like, are you going to be at, at Dry Diggins this Thursday? And I'd, I'd say, the words would come out of my mouth, yes, and then I'd think, oh, why'd I just say that? You know, because all I wanted to do was, I wanted to pull up the covers over my head and push you guys away, because I was hurt. I was like, how did I finally find the love of my life, and sobriety's supposed to be really good here, you know, and this stuff's going on. But I was right in the middle of AA, and I had no option. I could see how easy, if if I'm not involved in service work, how easy it would be to pull away. Because let me tell you, there's going to be a time when life hits you. And the only thing is, is, when you put your head on that pillow at night, it's between you and your higher power. And I had many times with that. What happened was our family grew closer and closer together. So, um... Doug ended up getting our, our home group, ended up saying, Bridget, you know, you're married to him. You have him the rest of your life. You give him to us for a month. And I'm like, what? I can't do that. They're like, no, you keep the hair salon operating. you got bills to pay. you got a daughter to take care of. A guy made a calendar, and there were two cycles each day of people picking him up from Auburn, driving him to Sacramento, bringing him back home. The next round would come. They'd bring a lunch for Doug, or they'd take him to lunch, you know, and, and do all this. I mean, you guys held this up and kept me sane and sober during that time. That was in September. The following January, he had to go to Chico for a, a month of treatment. Same thing happened. Our home group stepped in. We, My best thinking was I was going to, if we would have had that trailer, I would have let him stay in it in Chico. <laughs> but that trailer's demolished. It's like history. That was like 20 years ago. The thing was a pile. But um, there's members in our home group who are here today, some of my friends, and what they did was we, Doug and I were going to get a trailer and have him go up to Chico and stay in Chico. 
and two couples in our home group said we don't want Doug to stay there and paid for him to stay to bed and breakfast for a month. I got to run the hair salon. I got to take care of my daughter during that time. You get real, real grateful for the basics on that gratitude list. You know, I remember my sponsor, when I first learned what a gratitude list was, I'm like, can you give me an example? <laughs> Casey was really, I mean, she had no sympathy. And she'd say, yeah, you got food in your belly, a roof over your head, and gas in your car. And I'd be like, yeah, but, well, during those three years, that's how simple my, my gratitude list was. Around this time, I ended up getting a different, getting a different sponsor. Um, I just found it necessary to go into a different direction, and Doug was, Doug was now fast forward on the healing mend of, of this treatment. He started pulling out of it. He still is affected by it, but we've really adjusted our, our life to it. And our friend Terry Dougherty, who who used to do taping, was um, Doug's tape sponsor. We used to tape locally, and during this phase, Terry started kind of retiring out, and we were thinking, "What's Doug ever going to be able to do?" You know, and and um, he ended up being able to. This was such a hobby that it ended up. The Lyme's disease ended up being a catalyst to get him going in a new direction, and we ended up getting to be the NCCA tape librarian for this wonderful committee. <laughs> we didn't see what God had in store, but just kept on doing the next right thing. So I continued working with newcomers all through this whole time. I ended up getting a new sponsor. My my current sponsor today is Polly, and she lives in Washington. I love her very very much. She is a long distance sponsor, but it works for it works for me. And what you know, we do a lot of work together. And one of the things is when I ended up getting her to be my sponsor, but she said, Bridget, you're accountable for your sobriety. It's on you. And she also let me know that one of the things is. So you're going to have to want this stuff so bad that it's on you. And I do want this stuff really bad. So I, I take the suggestions. I follow through. I would like to touch on sponsorship. I truly believe that sponsorship is not dictatorship. We have all kinds of different sponsorship stuff going on. And when you have a sponsor, what, what my sponsor told me their responsibility is to do, and it's, it's my responsibility, is to take a sponsee through the steps, work with others, and to have them have a dependence upon their higher power and not them, and keep on doing service work. And that's what I do today. What I would like to share is what you guys have done done for me. Being able to learn how to be a mom in Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I didn't get custody taken of my daughter. I didn't know how to be a mom, and I've been able to be there and present for her today. You know, when I drank in the town of Auburn, I, I was a total disgrace to myself, to other people, and I was just like a hurricane through people's lives. I've had the same business for 11 years in our community. And this year, around May, in May, right before Mother's Day, one of our, one of our, um, things, an organization thing that's in the community was having a thing called Gala of the Heart. And what they were doing was nominating a mom of the year. So on May 5th, May, May 5th, Doug and I got to go to a black tie dinner, and I was honored because of what you guys have taught me for in our community of uh, being honored of a mom of the year. It's, 
it's not me, and I don't take any credit for it. It's just what, you know, it's suiting up, showing up, and doing the next right thing of what you guys have taught me. Also, one of the most awesomest things was this last Friday is our daughter graduated from high school. She's 18 years old, and, and she's just a, a beautiful lady inside and, and out. And I was, I was just sitting there waiting for her graduation to start and just thinking about what you guys have given me. Because when I came into these rooms, my best thinking was before I got sober, I was going to write a letter. I'm really good with writing letters. I was going to write a letter that when I was 29 and I died, that my brother and his wife were going to get custody of my daughter. You know, this disease is just that insidious. And I got to stay in here and walk through life on life's terms and not pick up a drink. Somehow break that cycle. And my daughter has a God in her life. And she's just this unbelievable young lady. The same, the same weekend that Doug went in for his treatment in Chico, was she got to get crowned Teen Miss Auburn also. You know, we have had the most amazing things happen. And that following year, we ended up getting Family of the Year in Auburn. I mean, it's like... What is, this? you know, it's like this, this program, it's just like if you're new here and wondering if this is going to work or not, it's, there's so much, there's so much hope here. The reason why I, I even mentioned that thing about the, the honoring of the mom of the year is it, I truly didn't tell people about it. I, I really didn't. I hid it. I was, I, I'm not that kind of person. I, I truly am not. But I told a friend in the program, and I read the letter to my sponsor of describing why I was nominated that. And, and I got so choked up when I was reading this letter to Polly. And what this letter said was that this, I was being nominated because I was a woman who walked through adversity. I was an outstanding member of the community. Kept my daughter going, kept the family going. Through the Lyme disease, I started in the letter, it also said that I started for in Placer County, the Lyme disease support group and public awareness for Placer County. And that I was an outstanding mom who still sent my daughter on mission trips. And it just went on and on. And do you know on that letter, there wasn't one thing that said Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> she didn't even know about that other side of the life. And, and at first I thought, but she doesn't even know I sponsor people. <laughs> she doesn't even know I do H&I. <laughs> just kidding. But, um... You know, and, and I think that we should be a reflection out there in the community. People, you know, if you want to break your anonymity, I'm fine with breaking mine. But I feel that not everybody, you know, I don't go around saying, oh, yeah, I'm going in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. If, if I find that someone needs it, you bet I'm there. That's the first and foremost thing in my life is I, I mean, I'm, I'm right there. But I, I also think that we could be good examples and we could be bad examples. And it's just you guys have given me a life that I had never, ever even dreamt of. In living life on life's terms, you know, even though I signed up for this deal, it doesn't mean that everything's going to be smooth. But what it does promise in the big book and through work in the steps is that we get to live life on life's terms and not pick up a drink. It's like, can we pass that acid test? Can we live with serenity through calamity? And that was what my last three years was like. 
and on the outside of it, it moved us in a whole nother direction. And there's lessons that I would never, ever have learned any otherwise, and I, I'm just so truly grateful. I'm sold on this program. And if you're new here, or if you're old here, I hope that you remain desperate. Because if you're new here, this life will change your life. And if you're old, an old timer, sometimes all that means is you're closer to the next drink. And that scares the hell out of me. So I'm going to keep on coming back. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.